Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is one class from the 2022 HVACR Symposium in Claremont, Florida. We have the symposium every year, and so to find out more information kind of upcoming, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. Big thanks to our sponsors for this event, which was AccuTools and TrueTech Tools. They're the two title sponsors that made the event possible. This session, my good buddy Tony Gonzalez. A lot of you will know Tony. He's been with Field Peace for a really long time. is a really great guy. He talks about how to use wireless measurement tools. Field Peace does a great job with their Job Link wireless measurement tools, which I talk a lot about on the podcast and in the videos. And Tony talks specifically about how to use them for successful HVACR diagnosis and troubleshooting. My name is Tony Gonzalez. I work for Field Peace, obviously. Uh, currently, I am the technical training manager. Um, I should give you guys an updated little bio thing, but that's, that's perfect. Um, so I've been with Field Peace for just over 20 years. Um, started in the warehouse, repair, uh, engineering, and now we do training now. And I'm trying to change the perception that training classes done by vendors are sales pitches. We have a lot of really cool application-based classes where we teach best practices and how to help you do your job easier, faster, and better. And so um, we're, we're trying to get the word out. We have a brand new online learning resource called Field Peace University. If you haven't heard about it, check it out. You can sign up. And we just launched it for technicians and contractors at the end of last year. Um, we have about a dozen or so different training courses on applications and how to use the tools in the field and we'll be adding more and more as we go along, okay? Um, it, if you have any questions about that throughout the week, stop by our booth, you know, we're right there in front and we can talk to you about it as well. It's free to sign up as well, okay? So today we're gonna be talking about wireless system troubleshooting and how to help you do that easier, faster, and better. If you have a question or anything throughout the presentation, please raise your hand. Um, hopefully it's not just like a sermon where I'm just kind of just like dictating everything. You know, if you guys have a question, comment, please feel free to ask whenever you like and be totally rude and interrupt me. It's all good. Okay, so in our industry, we all kind of work maybe in different parts of the industry, right? Like we have um, jobs that are residential in nature, jobs that are commercial in nature, jobs within refrigeration. Um, some do multiple of these things, right? But they're basically in those three different areas. Second is, Regardless of which area that you're in, when you arrive on site, you're there to do one of three things. Install something new, um, fix something that's wrong, or do some type of maintenance visit, okay? Uh, there really isn't much other than that when you break it down at a very high level. After that, whether you're installing something new, whether you're doing maintenance, whether you're fixing a problem, um, you need to ensure that the system is running at its top efficiency and that the refrigerant charge is dialed in correctly, that the airflow is set correctly, and that everything that has to do with the e e electrical aspect of the system is also working the way that it's supposed to work. So regardless of what job we're on, at, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to ensure that, that those three parameters are dialed in exactly what they need to be. Is that a fair assessment to say? Am I missing something there? Okay, perfect. So. In the olden days, it took time to do all of that stuff. It took time to check the refrigerant charge. It took time, it, if we even put the time into it, to verify that the airflow is correct. And all of that, because we had to do it serially, one at a time. And if we were a good technician, we would take the time and actually do that. But what happens many times is, you know, we just focus on, one of the parameters, usually just the charge, put some refrigerant in and we're on our way, right? Um, but now with the advancement of technology, we can do a better job in shorter time um, to, make, to make happy customers and to get more jobs done in the day, which at the end of the day, a tool is designed to help you do your job better and faster. If it doesn't, then why do we care around that tool anyways, right? With the advancements in wireless tool technology, we now have the ability to take multiple measurements at the same time and ensure, 
ensure that we have the refrigerant charge dialed in, the airflow dialed in, and the electrical parameters dialed in. This image is, is courtesy of HVACschool.com. They make awesome images, and they're so gracious to you know, share them when we want to do trainings and things like that. So let me ask you a question then. Is it useful to be able to monitor refrigerant charge, airflow, and electrical components at the same time? Why is that useful? Time efficiency, OK. Why else? They're related, right? Um, HVAC system is a dynamic system, right? What happens on the outside affects the inside and vice versa. So if we're taking these measurements serially, maybe that takes us, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes to do it you know, one at a time. And by the time we're done, the first measurements could have already changed, right? So having the ability to quickly connect tools at, at multiple locations on the system will allow us to get a better snapshot of what is going on, OK? Because at the end of the day, we're all in a business. Your business is to um, make your customers happy. You make your customers happy by doing good service, by building good relationships. And having happy customers brings in new customers, because word of mouth. And having happy customers uh, brings in revenue for your company. Yes, we want to do a good deed and we want to help others and improve cooling efficiency around the world. But if you're not making any money, it's really hard just to keep doing that. Okay? So at the end of the day, we need tools that are going to help us do that and help us achieve our goals to keep happy customers. So how do we do that? Well, I want to talk about a concept called high quality measurement. Okay? And in order to take a high quality measurement, there are certain steps that need to be taken. So let's just take a simple example. Well, actually, let's just go to step one. So um, in order to take what I call a high quality measurement is we need to have a goal in mind. What is it that we're trying to measure? OK, because there's different tests that we can perform on a job site. So in order to take a quality measurement, number one, we need a goal. So in this case, let's say our goal is to measure superheat. OK? That's our goal. We want to measure superheat on a system. So uh, uh, number one, make a goal. Number two, we need to understand what measurements do we need to take in order to achieve that goal. So let me ask you, if my intention is to get superheat, what types of measurements do I need to take? Excuse me? OK, so we need line pressures and line temperatures, right? That's what we need. We need a pressure and we need a temperature in order to get superheat, OK? Our goal, superheat. What do we need to measure? Pressure and temperature, OK? Step number three, location is key to take a high quality measurement, OK? Do I take those pressures and those temperature measurements on the liquid line if I want superheat? No, I do not. Location, where we place the tool, is important to having a high quality measurement. Okay? So if my goal is to measure a pressure and temperature for superheat, where do I take those measurements? On the suction line, right? Service valve, I mean, like we're really limited to where we measure the pressure. We just have the service valve. And we take a temperature as close as we can to that service valve, right? OK, so now we're there. After that, choosing the appropriate instrument to take the measurement. So let's take the example of pipe temperature. Would it be appropriate for me to bust out my IR gun and point it at the pipe to get that pipe temperature for my superheat? No, why not? It is, it is not accurate. But that's not the tool's fault. The tool is not, that tool is not designed to take that type of a temperature measurement, right? It is up to us to select the appropriate tool to take the measurements that we need. So what is a more appropriate tool to measure temperature on a pipe? Pipe clamp, right? OK, so we have our goal superheat. We know what we need to measure, pressure or temperature. We know where to measure it on the suction line. We know what are the appropriate tools to take that measurement. Finally, the last and important part is time. When should we take that measurement? Should we take that measurement when the system is off? 
No. Should we take the measurements shortly after we turn on the system? No. When is the appropriate time to take these measurements? 10, 15 minutes after we let the system stabilize, right? So all of these factors you guys are doing in your head without even knowing it, but they're all critical in order to take a high quality measurement. If one of these items is skipped, it really compromises the accuracy and the integrity of our measurement, okay? And what's great is we do it just automatically in our mind every single day, and we don't even know about it, okay? So remember, have a goal, what do I need to measure, um, where to take the measurement, what tool do I need, and when do I actually take it? Very good. So why is taking a high quality measurement important? Well, there's this process that you all go through, go through every single day when you arrive at, at a home or at a business. So first thing right there, oh, uh, pro tip, I need a spy on this clicker. You know how like in football when the offense has like a mobile quarterback, linebackers use this sign to be a spy, always watch the quarterback? This thing I always forget where I put it down. So if I say clicker, I need a spy that has watched where I put it down. Just help me out with that, thank you. Okay, so first thing that we do is we arrive on site and the homeowner or the business owner um, tells us what the problem is in their own way, right? So we take that data and we, and we have to process it in our mind. Remember, our goal is to fix the customer's problem. Whatever problem that they have, the goal is to fix it. Customer tells us the problem, we process that information, and then we use our senses, we use sight, we use sound, we use touch, hopefully you're not tasting things, um, to understand more about how the system is performing. So what are some examples of using our senses um, that we do to help understand more the problem with the system? What are some stuff that we use our senses for? We listen, right? Uh-huh, right. So we can hear things, right? We can look at things, right? Is the condenser coil completely gucked up with branches and dirt and, and leaves and all that? Is the filter all dirty? Um, so using our senses first is quick and easy um, to be able to help gather more information. Remember, the goal is to solve the customer's problem. And in order to do that, we need to gather information. The more information we can put together, the better we can put a diagnosis on the system, okay? So after we use our senses, then we need to take some measurements, right? To, to further add data to our, to our um, plan here of figuring out what is the problem with the system. Okay, we use our senses, we take a bunch of measurements, and then we process that information. So now we have more information in our mind. And then we communicate what, what, what we believe is the correct diagnosis of their system. Homeowner takes that information and has to make a decision based on the information that we gave them. And the decision that they make is gonna lead them to spending money, either with you or with somebody else, right? So how important is it in this process that you as the technician communicated accurate information to the homeowner? Very important. Why is it very important? You misdiagnose it, you give them the wrong price, it leads them to make a decision that may not solve their problem, right? And then you leave two weeks later, a week later, they call back, they got the problem again, and you have an unhappy customer, okay? So it's extremely important to take high quality measurements and use our senses in order to communicate to the customer accurate data and accurate information. And having tools that can help us do that faster will help us keep happy customers, complete more jobs in a day, and generate more revenue for your company, okay? So let's talk a little bit about system troubleshooting. Uh, the way that I like to break it down, maybe people break it down slightly differently, but to me, there's four main steps when we troubleshoot a system. Uh, number one, we need to understand the problem, okay? Number two, we need to identify the problem, find out what the problem is. Number three, we fix the problem. Number four, uh, retest system operation to see if our fix actually fixed the problem, okay? It's a long, complicated process, but if you break it down in the simplest form, it's those four steps. Is that fair to say? 
Okay, so how do we understand the problem? Okay, you guys arrive on site. How many times have you arrived on a job and you ask a question, so what seems to be your problem? My AC don't work. Does that help you in any way figure out what the problem is? It doesn't, right? But let me ask you this. Does your customer know how to communicate the problem in a way that's going to help you diagnose the system? Not usually. So then whose job is it to extract useful information for you in order to troubleshoot the system? It is your job, right? So how can you extract useful information from your customer? Right? Questions, yes, but I started with the question, what's your problem? And I didn't get a good answer, or I didn't get a helpful answer back, right? So what kind of questions? What are some examples? Just give me like one or two examples of what's a more useful question to ask that's going to help us um, troubleshoot it faster? Right, okay. So. Do you feel any air coming out? That's a simple thing for them to answer, and it's going to help you um, lead somewhere, right? What about something like, does your system turn on? Right? Something as simple as that, that the customer can easily answer, but that's going to give you valuable information on where to start, right? And then when we ask these questions, let's just shut up and listen. I mean, I can't shut up because I got to talk, but. When we're on site, when we're talking to our customer, let's just listen to them talk, okay? A lot of times we just like to keep on talking and we speak over the customer and then we don't really get anything back. Ask good questions that are gonna help you and then listen to your customer, okay? After that, uh, we need to find the problem. Now in this whole process, this is where the value is generated. How fast and how accurately can you find the problem to the system? Let me ask you this. How valuable is a technician to the contractor if they get the diagnosis right 100% of the time, but it takes them all day to do it? That's not very useful to the contractor, right? And also, goes without saying, someone that gets it wrong all the time, but they do it really, really fast, is also not useful to the contractor, okay? So this is where the value is generated in the field. How fast can you accurately diagnose the problem? So we talked about it a little bit. Visual inspection, we look at stuff, we listen to stuff, we feel some stuff, we feel air, you know, things like that. Um, and then we take measurements. Remember, taking measurements doesn't solve the problem for us. Taking measurements is only collecting data for us to use our experience and our brains to properly diagnose the system. You know, uh, the tool is not gonna necessarily do that for us. It is gathering data for us, okay? We're just constantly gathering data in, in, in order to make the most educated decision that we have on what the problem is on the system. So we do all that. And then what is relatively simple is once you find the problem, you fix it, right? You replace a part, you clean some stuff, whatever the case may be. Um, this is relatively straightforward. And then the last step is commonly over, overlooked, is retest the system to confirm that it is running the way that it should. And it makes sense sometimes in the summer, you know, there might be, I don't know, six to eight to, I don't know how many jobs you guys could, you know, particularly have slated for a particular day. Usually it's a lot. And um, it's understandable why some of these steps might be skipped but that's what's valuable having tool technology that can help you cover all of the correct bases in a timely manner so you can do the job faster but still do it right, okay? That's what we need tools for to help us do exactly just that. So in this scenario, we're gonna kind of go over these three sections here of airflow, electrical, and refrigerant charge. So other than a drill and other than a screwdriver, what, what in your estimation is the most used tool or measurement tool that you guys use on a regular basis? Your meter, right? Let's talk about using our meter. What are some of the most common measurements that you take with your meter? 
Voltage is where? Where? Contacts. Where else? Breakers, incoming, thermostat. What other type of e electrical measurements are you taking? Amperages, microfarads. You know, based on the information that we've extracted from the homeowner, right? Um, um, we would start with cer cer certain types of measurements. Now, um, when you're using a meter, what's important to you about that meter? Right setting? Functionality, what can it measure, right? Okay. Anything else we had over here? Ease of operation, accuracy, all that stuff, right? So um, I would also add what's important when you're using a meter is safety, right? You want to, when you're, when you're dealing with high voltages, when you're dealing with currents, um, things electrical in nature, you want to make sure that your meter is safe. Let me ask you this. What type of features do you notice in your meters that are in there specifically for safety reasons? Okay, so it might have a high voltage beep, Bluetooth, and how's that a safety thing? Okay, very good. What else do you think? Okay, let me just show you real quick a couple of things that are built strictly, whoa, sorry about that, with safety in mind, okay? Number one, magnets on the back, right? Put it up somewhere, like had it on the little box right there, work, work hands free. What's this little side thing for on a clamp? Why is that a safety feature? Frees up a hand. It keeps your hand physically further away from components or parts that can give you harm, right? Uh, Non-contact voltage. What's that for? Okay. Should we rely on the non-contact voltage feature as our primary check on whether something is energized or not? Absolutely not, right? So non-contact voltage is more like a secondary follow-up, right? We've gone on the breaker, we've shut it off, we don't know how that thing was wired previously. Secondary check, right? You know, to make sure that things are actually off when they are um, supposed to be off. Uh, LED on the top, when you open up the clamp to take an amperage measurement, can shed light in dark locations so your hand isn't touching something that it shouldn't touch, that you can't see. And this tip on top, Anybody know what this is designed to do? Right. Move away wires so we're not using our hand to spread open wires to get our clamp around a wire. So if you think about it, without even realizing it, there's a lot of features that are on your meters that are designed for safety that we don't even think about, right? So safety is important. Secondly, we're talking about what can the meter do, right? What type of measurements can it take? And is it going to give me accurate measurements on the type of equipment that I use? Let me ask you this. Equipment manufacturers are constantly um, advancing the technology of their systems. It's important, actually it's not a question, it's a statement. Um, it's important for your tools to keep up with that advancement of technology. Let me give you a great example. Variable frequency drives. Variable frequency drives are I don't want to say they're a new technology, but last 10 years or so, right? Um, they are coming more and more common in our industry on systems. What is the purpose of a variable frequency drive? It saves electricity, which saves money for the customer, right? How does it save electricity? Ramps up, ramps down. Right? When you need more cooling, you can ramp it up. When you have a low load, it can ramp it down. Okay? Now, how does it do that? How does it um, allow the system to be able to ramp up or to ramp down? Okay? It controls Hertz, right? And you have 
AC voltage coming from the power utility into the variable frequency drive box, right? And then that voltage goes into that box as an AC signal. It gets converted into a DC signal and then changed back into an AC signal before it's fed to a compressor, a fan blower, what have you. Now, in that process of changing from AC to DC to AC, there's a lot of electrical noise that is generated on that voltage signal. If you ever set it up on an oscilloscope, you'll see that the voltage entry in the vari variable frequency drive looks like a nice clean sine wave. Usually it's three phase, right? Um, but then if you put a scope on the exiting the variable frequency drive, that nice clean sine wave is gonna have a bunch of peaks and like things around it. And if we don't have a meter that has the ability to filter out that electrical noise, we are unable to take an accurate voltage measurement exiting a variable frequency drive. There's a perfect example that we were reached out to by a, a large commercial air balancing, balancing company in Spring, Texas, um, engineered air balance. And they work on three-phase systems all the time, variable frequency drives, and they reached out to us that they really liked the low pass filtering technology that is built into the SC680 and the SC480 meter. So we flew out there to go to their testing lab and all that stuff, and basically we were doing work on a four, 480 volt, three phase variable frequency drive pump system, okay? So entering the VFD, you had 480 volts coming in. Exiting, the controller said it was 240 volts coming out, okay? When we took measurements with meters that did not have filtering built into the meter, on the exiting VFD, we were measuring about 365, 370 volts, when it should have been 240. Now using one of the fill piece meters with the filtering, SC680, SC480, it was right at 239, right at 240 volts, okay? So as technology and the equipment advances, it's critical that the tools that, that, that you use, it's important that your tools keep up with the advancement in technology in equipment, okay? Um, so that's one on being able to take a high quality measurement, you gotta have the right tool. Your tool needs to have the right technology in order to take accurate measurements on a system. Now, also what's nice is how many of you are looking for ways in order to um, um, demonstrate to your customer the value of the service that you are providing them? Always, right? Well, let me show you a quick, easy way on how you can do it with your meter. So the SC680 meter, the SC480 meter can measure power live in kilowatts, okay? It's a very simple process where if you wanna measure power, you need voltage and you need amperage, right? So you take your test leads, you put your meter on the watts, which is the W switch position, and you just use your test leads to measure the voltage going into the outdoor unit, clamp this on either, if it's a single phase, um, L1 or L2, doesn't really matter which one, okay? Uh, pro tip, I would probably use alligator clips just so I can keep it on there when it's doing the measurement, or you, you, you could just do a quick check there and there, and then you'll instantly get kilowatts here um, on the screen on how much, how much uh, power that system is consuming. You do that, pretty much one of the first things when you arrive on site. Okay, uh, take a power measurement, add it to a job like report, write it down, whatever the case may be. Then you go about your job. You do the service, do the repair, clean a bunch of stuff, do everything that you need to do. At the end of the job, take another power measurement. Okay, and generally what's gonna happen is you're gonna see that the power consumption will have gone down on the system. So now you have something tangible to show your customer Based on the service that I just did, your system is consuming less power than it was previously. And that can help validate the work that you're doing for your customer. You know, we're always looking for ways to do that. Um, and it builds trust with your customer, and it's a pretty simple thing to do. It's a quick measurement to be able to show before and 
um, after to help validate the great work that you guys are already doing now. So uh, any questions on electrical testing right now? Yes, sir. Ooh, the door, so what he's talking about is on these meters, there's a little door here that prevents you from, ha from, from the ability to plug in your test leads and a thermocouple at the same time. And that's a safety regulation by UL that um, you are not allowed to allow the user to plug in a thermocouple and test leads at the same time. And so this is just the mechanism that we use at Philpiece to prevent that from happening. Would it, could you, would it harm the meter with a motion plug? Let's just say in theory somebody took the meter apart and pulled that door out. It can. Yeah. yeah. And then like pop it. Yeah. Destroy the meter completely by having both plugs in? Yeah, it could, it could, it could like pop it on the inside, right? Like, like if you're, if you have a thermocouple plugged in and you're touching the wrong voltage, you can damage the meter on the inside. Like, would it happen every time? No. But it could happen. It could happen. Yeah, that's what it's there for. Of course we would never do that both at the same time. Right? Never do that. But yeah, very good question. Thank you. OK, then let's move on to uh, airflow. OK, so um, when I talk about airflow, I'm not talking about in regards to the speed of the air per se. I'm talking about the airflow that is going into the air handler and out of the air handler. And there's a couple quick tests that we can do to help um, um, confirm whether or not our airflow is dialed in properly. We can take a delta T. Um, what's a delta T? Temperature difference, air coming in, air coming out. Okay. Another good measurement that that is not difficult to do is a total external static pressure test. What would that tell us? It'll tell us how much resistance is is the air exper whoops, sorry about that guys. Is the air experiencing as it goes through the air handler and throughout the entire duct system, right? Okay. So let's get into that too a little bit. Talk about a high quality measurement. In order to take a delta T, we need to have the right tool. A psychrometer is the tool for that measurement. Now, a tool also needs to be easy for you to use and install. So the Joblink psychrometer has a long flexible wand with the magnet on the back that you can use to stick in, insert into a duct. You have the right hole size in there. It's got to be a little bigger, but you know what I'm saying. You can stick it in there as a magnet, hold it in place and you could take one of your measurements there. Also, if you're unable to take the measurement at the air handler, which is the most accurate way to take it, right? But if you're unable to, for whatever reason, you can slide the magnet up and stick it onto a register or a grill in a ceiling or something like that, and also be able to take that measurement. It's pretty simple. If you have a grill that's not magnetic, um, there's a hook on the back of the magnet that you can just hook it onto a fin and just have it sit there, okay? So all you need to do is set up two digital psychrometers and you can easily measure what the delta T is. When we measure delta T, what are we looking for? What would be considered good? About a 20 degree difference, right? Now, does a 20 degree delta T tell us without a doubt that the airflow is perfectly fine? No, it's another data point that we're adding to our process of figuring out the problem, okay? So, but that's quick and easy to do. Set up two psychrometers, and you've added that test to your troubleshooting process, okay? Now, moving on to static pressures. Every manufacturer has a rating for static pressure. What's that rating called? What's that specification called? Total external static pressure. Sometimes it's called max static pressure. In this particular equipment, it's called test static, okay? And it's saying that the test static of, of this air handler is 0.2 inches of water column. What does that mean? What is the manufacturer telling us that the test static is 0.2? What does that mean? 
to us. Okay, that's where they tested it for there. And how does that, how does that number that we measure there affect the performance of the air handler? Okay, so what they're saying is that this equipment was designed to run optimally at 0.2 inches of water column static pressure or less. If the equipment is experiencing more than 0.2 inches of 0.2 inches water column of static pressure, then it is working harder than it needs to and could potentially lead to parts failures in the future. It's not going to run as efficiently as it can, but that's what that number is telling you that that equipment is designed to run most optimum at or below that static pressure. How many times do you encounter a system that is running at 0.2 or less of static pressure? 0% <laughs> of the time, okay? So another measurement that we can take to understand airflow a little better is do a quick static pressure measurement. And the Jobling system allows you to do that quick and simple. Now these are the this is the dual port manometer kit for the Jobling probes. Do these look like your typical dual port manometer? How are they different? <laughs> They're separate, right? So am I lying to you when I say this is a dual port manometer? Maybe I am. I guess it depends on how you look at it. But um, this was designed purposely to look different. You know, you have two single port manometers here that function as a dual port manometer with the Joblink app to quickly and easily take these measurements. Now, when we're talking about a high quality measurement, it's important where we take this location. So, if we're measuring static pressure on a particular piece of equipment, it varies based on the equipment type where we take that measurement, correct? Okay, so let's look at here. What, what do we have here in this piece of equipment? We have an air handler. What's inside this air handler? Blower motor, evaporator coil. Do we have a furnace in here? Do we have a heat exchanger? No. Okay. So in order to take an accurate total external static pressure measurement, where do I take the measurement on this equipment? So we take one here after the coil and after the filter, okay? Now, just hold it there for now. If we had a heat exchanger in here, would the location differ? Yes. If we have a heat exchanger in here, if we had heat exchanger, blower, coil, the coil is not part of your static pressure measurement. It's before the heat exchanger, after the blower, okay? So based on the equipment type, we need to be aware on where we place these actual tools. Now, does the position of your static pressure probe matter when you stick it inside the duct? In which way should this be positioned? Into the airstream, okay? So you drill a quick hole, you insert the probe into the airstream. Problem is, now I did lost visibility to the inside of this tip. How do I orientate it correctly? There's a red arrow on the back, okay? Or you use a Sharpie, right? This one saves you on your Sharpie budget, and it comes with the red arrow on there right now, okay? Uh, the the dual-port manometer kit comes with your static pressure probes, and they come with tubing, but because they're two single-port manometers, you can use really, really short tubes and have the versatility to install them on the system exactly where they need to go and not be encumbered by six to eight foot tubes on either side of your typical dual port manometer, okay? Insert it in, use the magnet base right here to hold it in place, and you're taking a good static pressure measurement. On the screen of, of your app, you're seeing a P1 value, you're seeing a P2 value, and you're seeing a delta there, okay? P1 minus P2. Now, I've had some questions. Tony, your Joblin gap does P1 minus P2. I was taught that when I take total external static pressure, I need to add those pressure values together to get my total external static pressure. But 
But what I'm telling you is, even with the P1 minus P2 of the app, you're still getting your total external static pressure. Why? Why am I, why am I not lying to you? One of them is always going to be negative, right? One of those values, when you insert it correctly, one is going to be negative, one is going to be positive. Simple math. If you minus a negative number, you are adding those two numbers together. So you are either going to get, let's say that our total, st total static came out to be 0.5, right? You are either going to get a 0.5 or a negative 0.5. You ignore the sign. It's just, it's just putting those numbers together and your static pressure reading is actually, or your, your total external reading is actually 0.5. Now, here's another cool thing about having the right tool. Many manometers in the industry, dual port manometers, have one pressure sensor. They have two ports, one pressure sensor. It's a differential pressure sensor. Means what it's showing you is the difference between those two pressures. If you wanted to get just a P1 value, you would need to take out you know, the uh, P2 probe, put it into regular air, so it can do the P1 minus P2, and one of them is zero. So why is that important? With the design of the job link manometers, you have two single port manometers, each with their own sensor. And if we were looking for a static pressure of 0.2 of what the manufacturer says that it should be, then in an ideal world, we might see 0.1 on one side, 0.1 on the other side, add them together, 0.2, right? In an ideal world. But what's simply going to happen is, um, one side, we take the measurement at the return side, we get 0.4. On the supply side, we get 0.1. Add those two together, that's where we got our 0.5 total external static pressure. But because you can see what the return side static pressure is and what the supply side static pressure is, what side of the system do you believe has the restrictions? The 0.1 side or the 0.4 side? The 0.4 side. So having the ability to see independently what your P1 and what your P2 values are are going to allow you to focus on the area of the system where you have the problem and not waste time looking at the entire system. Okay? And typically, we're going to find high, high, high static pressure on the return side, right? Because why? 30 filter, undersized equipment, all that kind of stuff, right? But because you have two independent P1, P2 pressure sensors, you can more quickly focus on the area of the system that has the problem and save time on the job site. Okay? You want your tools to be able to save you time and have you do an accurate reading um, quicker. Okay? Now, uh, moving on to the refrigerant charge. Um, this is something that you know, everyone kind of has a, has a really good understanding. We all gauge up. Take pressure, take uh, pressure, temperatures, all that stuff. Um, we want to measure subcooling. We want to measure superheat. We look at saturations, pressures. All of that is just more data that we're using to add to our, to our brain processing what is going on with the system. So it's important to take that accurately. You have a couple options now with advanced technology in tools. Um, you can use a digital manifold. Uh, what's nice about using a digital manifold? does all the math for you, right? You measure pressures, you measure temperatures, it does all the math for you. I'm going to carry on PT charts, open up your phone to get a PT chart, whatever the case may be. You just hook up two hoses and you do all that fun stuff, okay? Um, so that's one of your options. For sake of time, we're going to move on. Another option is you have wireless probes now, right? That can uh, connect directly onto a system and get you your pressures and your temperatures. What are a couple of the advantages of wireless, um, let's say, pressure probes? Cross-contamination. Cross you don't have as much refrigerant loss. You're not using hoses. Way lighter to carry around, right? You, aren't, you don't have your shoulder strap of hoses walking with your gauge hanging down, right? Sometimes it feels like really cool to have like the hoses around and we're just walking around, we just look like we're, you know, like what we're doing, right? So with probes, we kind of lose that cool factor, but it's fine. You know, we make it up on time and efficiency. But something that's really cool about the Joblink probes is that 
Um, they're the only ones with the built-in barometer to give you accurate pressure readings at varying elevations. So every time you turn it on, auto zeros to whatever elevation that you're at, you get, a, you get an, an accurate reading and um, angle fading to help fit into tight spaces. Now, a lot of questions I get asked. Tony, can I charge with refrigerant using a pressure probe like this? Yes, I can, right? If I'm just using that, no, I can't. But how can I easily move refrigerant while I'm using one of these things? Access T, valve core removal tool, right? Super simple. Um, I get that question so much that I created a two minute how-to video for Philippines University on how you actually do that, right? It's not, it's not real difficult. Show them how to hook it up, boom, all good, okay? So myth busted, all right? Now, I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about uh, pipe clamp accuracy. So the job link pressure probes, we talked about where we take the pressure measurements at the service ports. Where should we take our pipe clamp measurements for, uh, to get suction line pressure or suction line temperature, liquid line temperature? Yep, as close to the service valve. Well, so for evaporator superheat, right? Because we, we, we could be talking about two different types of superheat. But for evaporator superheat, pretty much right there at the service port, right? Now, um, you have two versions. You have the regular version that can measure up to one and three eighth inch pipes, like that one. Or if you're in a larger commercial application refrigeration, you have the big dog where you can measure up to four and one eighth inch pipe, okay? You put it directly onto the pipe and you quickly get your pipe clamp measurements, okay? Now, accuracy. Philpiece has a patented technology built into both of these pipe clamps called rapid rail sensor technology. One of the downsides, these have been designed to kind of limit that, but they still, you know, they can still be affected by, you have a single plate right here, right? This is a contact thermocouple sensor. You put it on a pipe, it takes a measurement. The only downside to that is anything that, is, that this metal surface is exposed to, direct sunlight, crud on the pipe, moisture, whatever, will, will, will also be part of measuring this temperature. So it could adversely affect the accuracy of your temperature reading. Again, these were designed to be a little bit better, but they can still be affected on their accuracy. Rapid rail doesn't work that way. It's easier to show on the bigger one. Rapid rail, you have two plates on either side. When you close them and these touch, you have closed the temperature sensing circuit, so it's measuring temperature right now. If you open it, you've opened the sensor circuit and it's not measuring temperature. On your app, it's just gonna say open or OL. You're gonna get a beep. Single beep is good. Flashing green is good. Oh, battery's dead on this one. Turn this one on. Single beep is good, flashing green is good. When I open it up, here we go. Single beep good, double beep, blinking yellow, it's not measuring temperature. Why is that important? Rapid rail sensor technology, when you put it onto a copper pipe, uses the conductivity properties of the copper pipe to make the pipe part of the sensor now. So it's not a sensor that is measuring temperature on the pipe. The pipe itself has closed the sensor circuit so you get an instantly accurate temperature reading that doesn't have to wait to stabilize down if it's been like in your truck in a hot and you put it on a cold pipe. You get an accurate temperature reading in one to two seconds uh, that is not affected by direct sunlight, wind, crud on your pipe, all that stuff, okay? If you put it onto a piece of pipe where it doesn't have, where like it's dirty and maybe it's kind of messy, you're gonna get a double beep with this blinking yellow. You can kind of wiggle it around to kind of cut through whatever gunk's on there so that you get good contact on the pipe. Um, or they also come with emery cloth where you can clean off a piece of the pipe to get good, good contact. Now that might seem kind of annoying, but why is that actually helping you? Can you get an accurate temperature reading of the refrigerant inside of that pipe if you're measuring on a bunch of like insulation gunk or just crud on the pipe? No, you don't wanna take that measurement at that location anyways. So you find a cleaner piece of the pipe or just clean off that piece of the pipe to get a good, accurate measurement, okay? So rapid rail sensor technology allows you to take a high quality measurement to get an accurate pipe temperature reading. Now, if you have an inaccurate pipe temperature reading, what is that going to affect? 
It's going to affect your subcooling superheat, which is going to affect what? It's going to affect what you do, right? It's going to affect what you have to do, OK? So it's important to get a good, accurate measure meeting there. So now we're going to wrap up. I know we're short on time. But um, in addition, many of your job link tools, if you have an SMAN manifold, work in conjunction with your SMAN manifold. If you're not about that wire life and you want to ditch the wires on your, on your SMAN digital manifold, you can purchase the job link probes um, temperatures and use them on your manifold. Wires are gone. If you want to be able to monitor the indoor unit with your job link psychrometers, you can have a bunch of uh, um, psychrometers, monitor your return, supply temperatures here and here, your delta T, and all that fun stuff on the screen of your manifold. You can hook up your wireless scale to show your weight so you can see your charge, your weight as you look at your super E subcooling. And the new uh, MG44 micron gauge can also work in conjunction with your manifold and override the sensor that is built into the manifold. S-MANs have a micron gauge built in. Is that the most accurate location to take the micron measurement? Absolutely not. Okay? Uh, it's more of a convenient thing. It's better than looking at analog gauges and trying to see a needle. It's better than turning on your pump, going to lunch for 30 minutes, coming back, my vacuum is done. Right? It's better than that. But to get a more accurate reading, you want to use a dedicated micron sensor directly onto the system to be able to get a more accurate measurement. And you can use that to override what you see on the screen there. So in summary, over the last couple weeks, there was a big update to the JobLink app where you can now better control your customer file. You start with a customer, assign different locations to that customer, assign systems to those locations, and save all your measurements and stuff with the paid subscription to JobLink. JobLink is free, though. All this, um, as far as the tools are concerned, you can get all your same measurements, all your same calculations without any JobLink subscription and still generate a measurement report with your company logo and your company information at the top right there so you can hand to your customer um, or keep for your own records to see how the system was performing. So wireless technology in conjunction with the JobLink app and the biggest separator, okay, when you're using your wireless tools, what is the single most important uh, spec on them or the way they work? Oh yeah, you know what, batteries are kind of important too. The range. If you don't have good range, you have paperweights, right? Job link system, still longest wireless range, up to 1,000 feet line of sight. If you're working through buildings, obstructions, slightly less, but you'll still get 700 feet. And you can, you can cover all the major job sites that you need so that you always have connectivity on your phone and visibility of your tools. It's important that you keep in mind that your tools need to keep up with the advancement of technology in our industry. Things are changing all the time. And it's important that your tools are also keeping up with that. If you have any questions moving forward on wireless system troubleshooting, or about the JobLink system, or about Philpeace University, or our Philpeace Ambassador Program, if you've never heard about that, come to our booth anytime during the show, and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Thanks for watching this video. Again, to find out everything we have going on, you can download the free HVAC School app on Android or on iPhone or go to HVACRschool.com. And then specifically up in the top, you'll see events to find out more about upcoming symposiums. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.